Welcome back to Anatomy on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In the previous video, we talked about sound waves. We defined what sound waves are, and we discussed how these sound waves move from the external environment, such as the air around you, and they move through the ear and ultimately penetrate the cochlea, which is going to be the organ of hearing. And just a brief review of what happened. Sound waves are going to enter the ear. They're going to travel through this auditory canal, which is usually called the external acoustic meatus, also called the external auditory canal. And those sound waves cause vibration of the tympanic membrane, also called the eardrum, which then causes vibration of the malleus, which causes vibration of the incus, which causes vibration of the stapes, and so if we zoom in on the stapes, what we see is there's this little plug right here, which actually covers up an oval-shaped hole. And that hole is called the oval window. Let's actually zoom back out. Okay. And so the oval window leads into the fluids of the cochlea. And more specifically, it leads into the fluid called paralymph of a region called the vestibular duct. And that's sort of where we left off last time. So what we're going to do in this video is we're going to pick up with the paralymph of the vestibular duct. And then we'll see it moves into the paralymph of the tympanic duct. All right, so this stuff is a little bit more challenging, but I'm gonna kind of explain what's going on here. So in this picture right here, we have the stapes. That's the third of the auditory ossicles, the final one. Here's the oval window. And you see that the oval window is just a hole, but it leads into this region right here called the vestibular duct. Now pretty much all this dark blue right here, where I'm tracing my mouse, all of this, this is all the vestibular duct, okay? As you round this turn right here and start going the other direction, anti-parallel, this is called the tympanic duct. Now, you'll see some different namings here. The one on the top is called the vestibular duct, but some sources will call it the scala vestibuli, okay? but it's the vestibular duct. Down here it calls it the scala tympani, but it's also called the tympanic duct, okay? And then in the center between both of these ducts, we have something called the cochlear duct, which is pretty much put in light blue. If you happen to see the term scala media, the scala media is the same as the cochlear duct. But just so you can trace the vibrations, it's gonna go from the oval window into the vestibular duct, or the scala vestibuli, turn this corner, and move then through the scala tympani, or the tympanic duct, and it will finally terminate at the round window. Now what's the point of vibrations moving through the vestibular duct and then moving through the tympanic duct? What's the point of that? Well, remember with sound waves, or just sound in general, certain sounds have, let's say, a higher pitch, or they're a higher note. Okay, um, someone who sings soprano has a higher pitch to their voice, and higher pitches mean higher frequencies. Okay, if somebody has a lower voice, a lower pitch, we would say, lower pitches correspond to lower frequencies. And it turns out that different frequencies of sound vibrate different parts of what's called the basilar membrane. Now the basilar membrane is something that exists pretty much on the base of the cochlear duct. We're going to look at that in more detail on the next slide, but understand this. Different frequencies of sound vibrate different parts of the basilar membrane. So for example, I've got this line right here. If we say a sound has a frequency, uh, we'll just put it right on this line where it was, 2,000 hertz, hertz is a unit of frequency. If we have a sound that has a frequency of 200 hertz, notice it's gonna vibrate this part of the basilar membrane, okay, right here. It's not gonna vibrate anything over here. It's not gonna activate anything over here, these parts of the basilar membrane, only this part of the basilar membrane. If we instead then have a sound with a frequency of 200 hertz now, so one-tenth of this, 200 hertz sound waves are gonna vibrate this part of the basilar membrane over here. And so the way that this works is different frequencies activate or vibrate different parts of the basilar membrane. And on a superficial level, this is how your brain interprets what the pitch is of a sound. So for example, if you were listening to an opera and one singer has a soprano voice, and the other singer, let's say, is a baritone, 
depending on which part of the basilar membrane gets activated, allows you to differentiate the soprano from the baritone. Okay? It allows you to differentiate the pitch. And that's pretty cool. Another example, if something had a, uh, let's say, a frequency somewhere in this region, I don't know exactly what the frequency would be, it would activate this part of the basilar membrane. Okay? And that would be detecting a very low frequency, okay, a very low note. Now what I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to take this line, let's just move it right back here. What we're going to look at the, on the next slide is essentially a cross section of this. So the best way to think about this is imagine this whole thing was a pickle, a pickle you eat, one of those long dill pickles that you get in the grocery store. If you take that pickle and you take a knife and slice it like this, basically slice it into one third of it over here, maybe two thirds over here, and then you look at the circle from the side, okay, you're taking a cross section of it right here, that's what this is, okay? And so just like we had the vestibular duct on the top, we had the cochlear duct in the middle and the tympanic duct on the bottom, we have the same thing here. Up here, this is the paralymph of the scala vestibuli, or vestibular duct. Down here, this is the paralymph of the scala tympani, or tympanic duct. And in the middle, we have the cochlear duct, which actually does not contain paralymph. It actually contains a different kind of fluid called endolymph. But that's not really super important. Just know the relative locations of these. Okay? Now, although the cochlea, which is what we're in, is really more the macroscopic organ of hearing, this part that looks really busy right here called the organ of corti or the spiral organ, this is really the microscopic organ of hearing. And there is an organ of corti for every single frequency. We're just on the one for 2000 hertz right now because, because we took a cross section right there. So now let's zoom in on the organ of corti and see what happens. So here's a zoomed in image of what we just looked at here for the spiral organ or organ of corti. Now, here's the vestibular membrane. The vestibular membrane is actually this membrane right here, although it's not labeled. Okay? Above the vestibular membrane, we of course have the vestibular duct. Beneath it, we have the cochlear duct. All the way down here at the bottom is actually the tympanic duct. And so what we can say here is, here's the basilar membrane right here going beneath the organ of corti. Okay? Up here's a new thing called the tectorial membrane. The tectorial membrane sits on top of the organ of corti. Notice these dark blue cells. These are called hair receptor cells, or sometimes just called hair cells. On one side of the hair cell, actually the side that is nearest the tectorial membrane, there's actually little hair projections called cilia that stick up, and they actually make contact with the tectorial membrane. On the other side of the hair cells, we have the axons that actually connect with fibers of the cochlear nerve. So hopefully you understand the anatomy. Now we can talk about the physiology. And just keep in mind, this segment, this organ of corti right here, this cross section, is only for 2000 hertz. If we had elicited a frequency of 200 hertz or 500 hertz, we would have a different section of the basilar membrane, but they would all look identical to this, just for a different frequency. All right, step one, paralymph of the vestibular duct causes vibration of the endolymph of the cochlear duct. So basically what's happening is, remember that we had vibrations coming through the oval window and they cause vibrations in the vestibular duct. So all the paralymph inside the vestibular duct or scala vestibuli is vibrating. And again, just like vibration of the malleus caused vibration of the incus, which caused vibration of the stapes and so forth, Vibration of this paralymph causes vibration of the endolymph in the cochlear duct. And so that vibration is translated into this next region, that is the cochlear duct. And then vibration of this endolymph in the cochlear duct causes the vibration of the basilar membrane. And so the basilar membrane corresponding to that frequency, 2000 hertz in our example, that basilar membrane, this one, vibrates, okay? And what that causes is it's causing it to move kind of back and forth, left and right, let's say. And that causes these hair cells to also vibrate, and that causes them to kind of brush these cilia against the tectorial membrane. 
Okay, so these hair cells are kind of being moved against the tectorial membrane, back and forth, back and forth, almost like you took a hairbrush and just kind of moved it over your skin, like your arm. If your arm was the tectorial membrane and you're just moving the brush back and forth against your arm, that's what's happening to these cilia. So in other words, let's regroup. When the basilar membrane vibrates back and forth, back and forth, it causes these hair cells to move back and forth, back and forth, which causes these cilia to move back and forth and they scrape against the tectorial membrane. Now, when those cilia of these hair cells scrape against this tectorial membrane, the hair cells themselves detect that scraping. So the cell part of it actually detects that, okay? So the hair cells detect the cilia scraping and they activate these axons. They depolarize and that sends information to the cochlear nerve and ultimately to the brain. So whenever these cilia scrape against the tectorial membrane, the cells themselves detect that and transmit activating signals to the axons here, which converge with the cochlear nerve. And then ultimately, as we'll see on the next slide, your brain detects a sound of that frequency, okay? And another thing I wanted to point out is that harder scraping results from greater volume. So for example, if we go back to that opera example, the soprano singer, if the soprano singer had a part of her piece where she was singing a particular note very quietly, and then all of a sudden went to singing that same note very loudly, so fortissimo, as they say, and it was the same note, then the louder note with greater volume would elicit the same basilar membrane to vibrate because it's the same frequency, but since the soprano's doing it louder, then the basilar membrane would vibrate harder and the cilia would scrape against the tectorial membrane harder. And so the harder the scraping is, the louder your brain perceives that sound, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. Now, we're about to go into the primary auditory pathway, how these uh, signals reach the brain, but before we do that, I wanna do a very brief recap of all of this, just to put everything together in one coherent pathway. All right, so starting with the outer ear or external ear, we have sound waves that enter the ear canal uh, via the external acoustic meatus, those sound waves cause vibration of the tympanic membrane, and then vibration of the malleus, and then vibration of the incus, and then vibration of the stapes, which covers the oval window, that hole. And so then you have vibration through the oval window into the paralymp of the vestibular duct. All right, and remember we have vibration of the paralymp of the vestibular duct, all right, and that activates different regions of the basilar membrane depending on what the frequency is. Remember, if we change this to 200 hertz, it activates a different region of the basilar membrane. All right. So going back here, if we have vibrations of the paralymph in the vestibular duct, that's going to cause vibrations of the endolymph in the cochlear duct, which causes vibrations of the basilar membrane. Okay. And if the basilar membrane vibrates, that's going to cause everything up here in the organ of corti to vibrate. So these hair cells vibrate, and they kind of, as a result, scrape these cilia against the tectorial membrane. And when these cilia scrape against the tectorial membrane, the cells themselves, the hair cells, detect this scraping, and then they transmit activating or depolarizing signals to these axons, which converge on the cochlear nerve, and that helps you perceive sound, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. And just remember that harder scraping results from greater volume or a more intense sound, okay? So if it's louder, it's harder scraping of these cilia against the tectorial membrane. Hopefully that makes sense. Now, another thing I wanted to mention is that the cochlear nerve, remember, is half of the vestibular cochlear nerve, which is cranial nerve number eight. The cochlear nerve will actually converge with the vestibular nerve, uh, which is something we're going to be discussing in the next set of videos. But the vestibular nerve fuses with the cochlear nerve and becomes the vestibular cochlear nerve. Now, the primary auditory pathway. This is the pathway that uh, axons will take and the different things they'll encounter on the way to the primary auditory cortex of the brain. 
So as I mentioned, the cochlear nerve fuses with the vestibular nerve and becomes cranial nerve 8, V-I-I-I, the vestibulocochlear nerve. Now the cochlear branch of cranial nerve 8 sends information through the following structures, which you can kind of follow along in this picture. So here's the cochlea on each side of the head. So the cochlea sends information via the cochlear branch to the cochlear nucleus. Notice that there's some decussation, meaning crossing over. So some of the uh, information from the right cochlea is actually going to the left side, and some coming from the left is going to the right, but not all of it. But notice there is some decussation. And then from the superior olivary nucleus, information goes to the inferior colliculus, which is the bottom half of the corpora quadrigemina, right, of the midbrain. And then information goes to the medial geniculate nucleus, which is part of the thalamus. That's one nucleus that's inside the thalamus. And then from there, information goes to the primary auditory cortex, which is part of the cerebral cortex in the temporal lobe of the brain. Now, the primary auditory cortex, as you may have mentioned in the past in your class, simply detects the presence of a sound of a particular frequency or volume. So this part of the brain does not identify the sound. Okay? So for example, if you heard a cat meow, you know it's a cat, presumably, but knowing that it's a cat has nothing to do with the primary auditory cortex. Okay? The primary auditory cortex simply detects that there is sound. It does not identify it. So if you had a destruction of the primary auditory cortex, or a lesion of it, that would simply cause deafness. You just become deaf. You wouldn't be able to perceive that there is sound. But from the primary auditory cortex, some of that information is then going to go to the nearby auditory association area. This is one of the regions of the cerebral cortex that identifies the sound. And so this would be part of the brain that identifies the sound you had as coming from a cat. And so if you had a lesion of the auditory association area, you would still be able to perceive that there is sound, but you would not be able to identify it. You'd be hearing this cat meow all day, but you would have no idea what the sound is whereas lesions of the primary auditory cortex simply would cause deafness, all right? And so this is the primary auditory pathway. I hope you learned a lot in this video and now understand how audition or hearing works on a physiological level. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.